Before we get into the five methods, um, I want to encourage you to consider something. I have to put us on gallery view. There we go. I want to see all your faces. Many of you have heard this. It's okay. Particularly Buddhists, we just like to repeat ourselves. Why? Because honestly, everyone forgets the second we get off the Zoom call anyway. So just bear with me. And then if you're like, gosh, I've heard this 10,000 times, first, notice if you're actually implementing it in your life. And then second, um, is there a new hearing available to you? Can you hear it in a new way? Beginner's mind. Yoga Journal says we meditate to get calm. I think Headspace says it. Probably Calm says it, that that would indicate something by their name. On Mind Oasis, we don't suggest that. Maybe some of our guest teachers do, that's fine, like that's their jam. But the truth of the matter is your meditation practice is here to wake you up. And if you're feeling frisky like I am, it's to wake you the F up. What does that mean? It means you might get calm, it means you might not get calm. But what it will bring you, your meditation practice has the capacity to bring you, the potential to bring you, is complete clarity. And through complete clarity comes freedom. I spent two hours dancing yesterday, all with the shadow, all with my shadow which means I spent two hours basically sobbing and falling on the floor, held in space by a fantastic teacher. It is our meditation practice that allows us to dance with the shadow, to celebrate with the light, and to get really real about what our heartfelt desire is. So Buddhists get a bad rap for saying life is suffering, but because you are born, you have to die. Because something is created, it has to break down. It's just the nature of this world. That is the nature of this world. It's the nature of your existence. And our meditation practice is here to hold us. I described it in a post recently as a companion that's always there for us. Always. Just think about that. Partners come and go. Sometimes you like them. Sometimes you don't. Children come and go. Friends come and go. The weather. All of that is changing. But your practice, if you engage it, is always there for you. Which means you have freedom at your fingertips in any moment. It doesn't mean it feels good. It doesn't mean you don't spin out. It doesn't mean that you spiritually bypass. Please don't. I can give, I will give you a personal example on a one-to-one -one call if you'd like to hear about what spiritual bypassing can look like. You will end up in the dirt, beaten up. So you don't deny your experience. If your experience right now sucks, it sucks. And that's actually exactly what your meditation practice is like pinpointing. It's saying whether the sky is cloudy or the sky is sunny, right at this point, that is what it is. That is the essence of presence. And that's why we get on our cushion. We do these things over and over again. We hear the same words, find the space, find your breath, do a little bit of movement, go through the five senses. And in a sense, it kind of seems like, geez, Louise, like we're on repeat. We're on repeat so that we have that to access at any moment. So when the joy is really joyous, we remember, there's just a little remembering, this is gonna change, I should celebrate the hell out of it. So it lifts, it amplifies the joy. It amplifies the celebration, why? Because you know it's gonna be a shit show soon. Lama Marut. You're either in a crisis or you're between crises. I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, geez, Louise. But honestly, the between the crisis is the time that you celebrate. And the other thing he likes to say is never let a good crisis go to waste. So then when you're contracting, right, you can even see my body. When you're in a more contraction mode, when everything's falling apart, 
And sweethearts, I am in that mode often. So I am with you. I am a meditator. I am a practitioner. That contraction, that's when you dig into your practice and you say, what's here for me? And there is deep, deep knowing that each of you have, each of you have, and you have the practice that allows you to connect with it. The backdrop to all of this is before you meditate, before you do a gosh darn thing, you really need a private space. Now, for those of us who live on our own, no big deal. For those of us who um, live with others and find it difficult to find a space, I know a lot of people who meditate in their closet, and I'm not kidding. And even if it's just a corner where you face into the corner and you say to the people around you, I'm going to meditate, and you put on your noise cancelers, you have to have privacy. And then you can create an energetic boundary. And um, quickly, I'll just say, you know, you can just imagine sort of a diamond wall all around you, an egg, a diamond egg all around you. That's a private space. You could be in the middle of the subway station and you can create a private space. Okay. And then you tidy up a bit. And right now my space is a little too messy for me. So I just took a few things because I ran out of time. And I put them in the garbage and I put them somewhere else and I, and I did put up my really nice flowers. Why? Because you're tidying up your mind. And when you tidy up your mind, you have to look at the inside and the outside. And if you're Buddhist, you look at the secret too. But inside and outside is enough. So, you know, tidy up your space a little bit. You don't want to be in the middle of a lot of muck. And then importantly, and if you don't like the word sacred, then use just important. But I think sacred objects around you are important. And a sacred object might be a wrench that grandpa gave you when you were 10. That could be a highly sacred object to you. So just because my sacred objects look like flowers and incense and candles doesn't mean that yours wouldn't look like tools, uh, stones that you gather from outside in special places, sand and the like. All righty. Don't skip that part. That part is important. There's something going on in your mind. You're preparing, right? And then if you like incense, um, you can light a little incense and that is sort of a trigger too that something's about to happen that's different than the normal. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what I think some of the greatest obstacles are to a consistent and beneficial practice. And then you are going to tell me what I've missed. So to me, still, even as the leader of Mind Oasis and as a longtime practitioner, I still think one of the greatest obstacles is just doing it. You know, just getting your asana on the cushion. And then further doing it consistently, you know, like, is it five minutes here, 30 minutes there? Then you're like, oh my God, I feel bad. I better meditate for two hours. And then it's like three days go by. And then you're like, okay, I'll meditate for 10 minutes. Like, you know, it's kind of ping pongy, right? I think we, most of us, um, experience mind wandering and fantasy, right? All of a sudden you're like having a drink in Tahiti or having sex with another person or like whatever happens on your cushion. And you're like, how the hell did I get there? And then the dance is to come on back, right? And to celebrate it, it's okay. And then I think the other two things that happen to most of us is drowsiness, where we're, we're sleeping, literally. Um, I notice a lot of people sleeping in my classes, which cracks me up. I'm like, wow, if you can sleep in my class, you can sleep in anybody's class. Um, and spacing out. I think a lot of people think they are meditating when they're actually spacing out. That's been a lot of the feedback I've gotten in the um, meditation immersion is people will say, I actually don't think I knew how to meditate before you taught me Karuna because they were just asleep. I call it navel gazing. So just quickly, I'd love to hear from you and you can just take yourself off mute. If there are other 
um, obstacles that you experience um, in your practice? I always love when you say about going to Tahiti with a drink because I never get to go to Tahiti. I'm always going to the to-do list and like what e I start writing emails in my head of like who I need to email next. That's my biggest obstacle is like getting all that put away. Good, good. Thank you. Anybody else have anything else that they experience? Sometimes I find it difficult, depending on the physical position that I'm in, to um, maybe uh, take the cleansing breaths or, you know, sitting sometimes doesn't seem to facilitate it quite as easily as laying down. And I cannot sit on the ground. I, well, I don't know. I can't say I can't. I have tried it a few times. It doesn't seem to work well for me, chair or laying down. Chair or laying down does work. Cushion doesn't work. That's totally fine. Nobody has to sit on cushion. Totally fine. But that I but thank you for the physical comfort is what I took from that, really. David? What? Well, I saw you took yourself off mute, so I thought you had something to share. I did. I think I think most of my obstacles fall under generally the things that you mentioned. Um I find myself trying to fit everything in. I went to the grocery store in the half hour before uh, before your teaching. And so, I don't know, uh, taking the time. It, it's kind of just doing it, uh, going to that focus. But, yeah. Nice. Anybody else? Joan. And me, so your list was was good. I mean, it really covered a lot. I could definitely relate to um, probably everything that you mentioned. And for me, and I'm not even sure why, but I think when I'm at a place where I really feel that meditation would benefit me because maybe, you know, there's just so much going on and maybe I'm in a state of overwhelm or life really kind of sucks, um, it's harder for me to get to the cushion even though like, you know, it's a win-win. So not sure why, but that's what I came up with. I like it. And you know what they say, there's that very frustrating old adage that when you have a half hour to sit, sit for an hour, when you have no time to sit, sit for two. <laughs> Cause we know, we know we, we benefit. I'll just share quickly that um, I used to prepare for like business meetings um, by like pouring over the numbers and making sure I had all my arguments, you know, all my ducks in a row and all that bullshit. I meditate now. And I think I'm a much clearer leader for it. So like I say that as an inspiration, it might not be a business meeting, but like are the tools of med your meditation practice actually more potent and helpful than you even realize for when life is overwhelming. Method one of five is checking your motivation. So some of these you're going to notice happen before you meditate. Some happen on the cushion. This is, this is sort of like ground zero. So you've tidied up your space a bit and you have sat down late, lie down, you're walking. Walking meditation is a beautiful method to meditate. There's a trick to it. So you're not just like exercising, but it's really a beautiful way to um, engage your practice. So one of the things that I'm going to encourage you to do, if you haven't, is to really get into your heartfelt desire. If you ever do the meditation immersion, you know that this is really where we start. Like, what are you here to do? What is your purpose in this life? Not the one that like mommy and daddy told you with the white picket fence and all that happy horse shit. This is you getting down deep into your heart, deep into your 
that place of all knowing your intuition and understanding your heartfelt desire and then using that heartfelt desire to show up for you. Because when you learn how to show up for you, then you're of benefit to others. So I'll share with you my heartfelt desire as an example. It's to awaken fully. And then I go one step further and say, why? Why? Because I see so many people suffering and I suffer so much myself. And I believe that as we wake up more and more to all the possibilities of our life, that we can show up in profound ways for others and that we can help to alleviate suffering. And if you need an example, you can look at Mind Oasis. I mean, I have had to fight tooth and nail to make Mind Oasis work. Why? For all of us so that we can be here today. I've had to go through extraordinary hoops <laughs> for us to be here today. Now, I'm not saying like that's nothing about Karuna. What that's about is my heartfelt desire is to awaken fully. Why? To alleviate the suffering of this world. So then I say, how? And for me, it is through sharing these unbelievably beneficial practices that my teachers have taught me. They have held me when I have fallen over and over and over again, and they have rejoiced with me and invested in this vessel in unbelievable ways for all of you. So you don't have to go start a mind oasis. Yours could be in your home. Yours could be in your, your classroom. It could be with your one precious grandchild or child that you are raising. But in order to show up in whatever way your heartfelt desire is for others, could be your employees, whatever it is in this world, Notice it's not about getting a Ferrari, though I did see a Ferrari recently and I would totally drive one. They're a hot car. This geek, sorry for all the geeks out there, but it was great. It was like this 30 year old kid, total nerd glasses. You know, he's making a bazillion dollars out of his condo in Boulder, got into his 12 cylinder Ferrari, started that bugger up. And I was like, oh man, I would totally drive that thing. It was awesome. So we rejoice. We have fun, right? It's not all about the heartfelt desire but you're fueling your cylinders with that heartfelt desire. So you know what it is, you sit down and every time you get on your cushion, you're like, my heartfelt desire is to awaken. And sometimes you might not feel <laughs> that way, but it's a good touchstone. You come back to it and then revisit it each year and say, well, maybe it's shifted a little, maybe it's bigger, maybe it's a little bit smaller. Maybe it's just to like slightly awaken this lifetime because the full awakening thing's kind of getting a little too much. And then each day you tap in as well to your heartfelt desire. <clears throat> and sometimes it's hard. Like if you're having a hard day, it might be hard. But you check your motivation when you arrive to the cushion and you will find that that bleeds out into your life. So the point of all of this is not so that you're a great meditator. If you want that, there's a community that I can point you to because they're all very interested in being the best meditators on earth. But if you get them, in my experience, into any sort of life situation, they fall apart at the seams because they've only really been practicing for hours and months and years on their cushion. Well, you all know you get off your cushion and you get the phone call, you get the partner, you get the pet, you get the whatever in your life, the person who cuts you off in traffic 10 minutes later, and all of a sudden, boom, your meditation practice is dropped to the wayside, right? So what we're practicing for on our cushion is our life. So that if the partner pet person on the phone is unkind five minutes after you just decided that you were going to dedicate the merit of your practice to all beings being happy and free, that you might actually be able to do this. Just zip it on up, let that person have their experience and carry on with your day and not even get jarred. Not even, it's like just Teflon, baby. And then the next time it might not be, it might stick like Velcro and then you're, you know, in your mind and doing all the things that we all do. But your practice is like 
designed to make your life richer. Notice I do not say better. You will not hear me say more positive. Why? Because it's bullshit. Positivity gets you so far. Bigger, more free, with more diamond wisdom, that gets you freedom. More wisdom, more compassion. That gets you to freedom. I'm very sorry for all the positive people out there. I apologize in advance, but you guys know me. Okay. And then you can kind of check in. So, so like you might think on community meditation that we're just going through some formula and you hear the same things. There's actually a method to the madness. Those three lenses, when we check in with how we're feeling physically, emotionally, and kind of the quality of our mind, which is a little less easy to define. I think that's a very personal exploration. Those are designed to get you out of your thinking mind and to get you into your somatic experience. I don't usually say emotional body. You'll hear me say it once in a while, largely because I don't think people understand what that means. But you're really getting into your emotional body that's connected to your body body, your physical body, which is connected to your mental state of mind. And those three things are informing your experience in every moment. And one at, you know, and they switch to who's more dominant. The, you know, sometimes if you're in pain, if you're in chronic pain, then the, the dominance is probably in the physical sensations of your body, but there's also your emotional reaction to the physical sensations in your body. And then if you're like me, you get on repeat in your mind and it's just this crazy f feedback loop, right? And this is kind of what we're doing all day long. So there's just these shifts. So when you sit down, don't lie to yourself. You tell you how you really feel this morning or this day in those three arenas. So the second method is making friends with all the dragons. And if your mind went to like scary dragons, I'm going to encourage you to see friendly dragons. Who was it? Puff, right? Puff the magic dragon. Yeah. So there's like a friendly dragon. There's the scary dragons. And then there's a whole bunch of dragons that you don't know and you don't care about. They're not your kind of dragons. Okay. So you can just kind of picture them. There's a place in my sadhana, my personal practice, where you picture um, 10,000 dragons in the sky, which is amazing. So you've got 10,000 dragons in the sky. And what these represent are thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, sounds in your space, sounds within you. And I'm here to tell you it's all workable. And not only is it all workable, it's really important for your meditation practice. So if you ever encounter someone who tries to say that meditation is about stopping your thoughts, please run, run away. Don't hang out with that person. They don't know what they're talking about. Meditation is really, I think, to meet your full on experience in your life and you practice on the cushion. So don't think of a time that's normal, but just think of a time on your cushion when it was really hard. Something had happened. Your heart is racing. I've had this one where I like, I'm having a panic attack and I'm trying to guide meditation at the same time. It's trip. It's tricky. You know, your, your heart's racing or minimally you're feeling upset because of something that happened with someone else. Um, you can't find your breath, it's short, or you just have racing, repetitive, really negative thoughts. So you just got into it with someone, you had already told yourself you were gonna sit, so you go and sit, and then you're into it with someone on your cushion, trying to sort of like resist that because that's not what you're supposed to be doing on your cushion. So that's an extreme example. The other example is just being checked out. And I see this quite a bit where you're just kind of like, 
I don't know, you're kind of like, you know, you're sipping the coffee. I do this all the time. You're sipping the coffee. You're kind of like thinking about your to-do list. Someone was a to-do lister, um, you know, or you're like, you know, having fantastic sex with someone that you're not supposed to be. I mean, whatever it is for you, like, I'm just saying like, you know, these things happen where we're kind of like spacing out and we're not engaged in what's happening on the cushion. What these dragons are, is they're actually a touchstone. Now, they're a touchstone that you will only be touching lightly. And this is where I've been teaching a lot about the blue sky. You're the sky. Everything else is the clouds. And from a simple perspective, that makes sense, right? Your mind is sort of like a blank slate. And then there's things that come on and you have experiences and sensations and all of that stuff and memories and fantasies and all of those goodies, the to-do lists. In your space, you have sounds. Maybe you have dogs that are annoying and bark like mine. Maybe you have a cat who likes to make biscuits on your knees, like whatever it is for you, you have all of these inputs. These are the dragons, love them, let them be. The adage, what you resist persists is so true. <laughs> Okay, so when you sit down, just allow the dragons to be there. They are the clouds, you are the sky. If you get tangled up with one of your dragons, the to-do list, the fantasy, the rejection, the repetitive thinking, when you noticed you when you notice, excuse me, you come back to the sky. This is why we use the breath as an anchor. The power is in the noticing. How does this relate to your life? You have dragons all damn day that are all around you demanding your attention. Some are internal, some are external, some really exist, some not so much, right? Most of our life, <laughs> we're just, we're having arguments with people that never even happen. I think it's Mark Twain that says something like, I don't know, there's a great Mark Twain quote, I'll try to come up with it, right? We're just, we're engaging in fantasy all the time. So can you come back to the sky rooted, grounded, available, solid? Every one of us has someone in our life that are the exact opposite, opposite of that. Is that who you go to when you need help? Hell no. You go to the person who is solid, grounded, rooted, and helpful. You all, whether you wanted to or not, have signed up for that by coming to Meditation on Mind Oasis. Why? Because we are warriors of the heart. We are trying to change this world. What's our vision? <clears throat> Connecting a compassionate global community. How do you do that? By showing up, by having a strong practice, and being available in profound ways. It might just be in your own home, but that ripples out into the world energetically, and also by the way that the people in your own home feel loved and seen and felt and heard. And most people in this world do not feel loved, felt, seen, or heard. This is your practice. It is not to calm your anxiety. <laughs> it helps, but, but it's more than that. And that's why when I say, I don't know what the hell I call this thing, amplify and align, that when I say amplify, I'm not saying amplifying the crap. I'm saying it's amplifying your existence. It's reminding you of your potency in this world. Okay, let's see what the next method is. So you've got your dragons all around you and you actually like them now. You're like, oh, hello, sad dragon. I know you really well. Five senses. So when you sit on your own, please use your five senses before you drop into your breath. Don't come in too hot. The only thing coming in too hot will do for you is to ha <laughs> to ha help you have a really frustrating meditation. If you end up only hanging out with your breath for two minutes, but you take six minutes to go through your 
five senses, that's a really good practice. So why? You know, this is the stuff that we can't get to on community meditation because it takes too many words. Why do we use our five senses? Because they're available to you at any time and they're dropping you out of your thinking gray matter mind into your feeling, sensing heart mind. In Tibetan Buddhism, your mind is here. It's in your heart. So when I say Oma Hung, the Om is a blessing of my body. The Ah is the blessing of my speech. And the Hung is a blessing of my heart, mind. They, they say it's like the same. It's your heart, mind. So you go through your five senses. I like to do eyes first, nose, mouth, hearing, touch. Sometimes I think we get on rote, like we hear, oh, eyes, and we're like, oh, okay, there's a little light, there's a little dark. But like, have you actually played with periphery? Have you ever dropped the story of what you think you're seeing and instead moved into the raw experience itself? Or like you can't really smell anything, but there's always scent there. Can you go a little bit deeper, further in your exploration of what scent does exist? And if not, then can you go deeper into what it is like to not have a scent? I'm gonna skip the other ones though. I'm going to say something about the mouth. The mouth has so much going on. You could spend probably an entire half hour in your mouth if you wanted to. So again, I'm just encouraging you to go deeper, richer when you hear those five senses. And I'm going to get to why. You're going to see, I think it's in slide five, the fifth method, that when your mind is bonkers and bananas, and I hope those are okay terms. I've been thinking about the words I use. Um, but that to me, it's like the monkey mind, right? It's just kind of all over the place. Zooming back out, particularly to the sensation of air on your skin, and particularly to the sounds around you, is the antidote to the bonkers. Use that. Don't be like, oh, but I already did that part. Like, give yourself full permission to regress back to anything that helps you. Don't just stay in one place because you think you're supposed to. Please drop that shit. Do you in your practice because you're going to learn so much about you. And that's what we're doing. We're learning about us so that then we can be so profound when we go out in the world. Okay, everybody take a peek at the snow globe. <laughs> So it's actually a circumpunct, C-I-R-C-U-M-P-U-N-C-T. <clears throat> the circumpunct is probably the most profound tool I've been given. Thank you, Michael Hewitt. I bow at his feet. You're the dot, you're in the middle. The reason we use the sound around us is to draw a line around us. So like when I say find the furthest most sound, you can connect to that sound and then just draw a line around you. And then you can imagine that you are in the center of the snow globe. And that line is sort of like the globe around you. And everything that's happening within there, those are your dragons. Thoughts, sensations, um, feelings, sounds, movement of wind, like my furnace just popped on. That's your field of awareness. And if you write nothing else down today, and if you take nothing else away today, just please grab onto that one. The field of awareness is everything that's just kind of happening. The dot is attention. 
And when we direct our mind through the five senses, you are directing your mind. Now, notice I'm not saying controlling. One, I don't like the word. Two, I don't think that's exactly what you're doing. You're saying mind, I want you to, yeah, it might be control, but we're gonna go with directing. Largely because the word control has some issues because people will say, oh, meditation is controlling your mind. Well, you try to control your mind for more than about a minute and see what happens, right? Your mind starts controlling you back. So this is directing your mind. And what you're doing is you're saying, mind, notice the sensation of light. Mind, notice the scent. Mind, notice the taste. And then what that's moving you towards is mind, notice the anchor of your breath. The sensation of breath. Now, a more accurate way to describe this would be that there is an observer observing something happening. It's more accurate. I think it's really what's happening. But then we'd have to get into about two hours worth of kind of ego and Buddhist philosophy that if you ever want to hear, you can come to my Thursday morning class and then you can fall asleep and snooze on me like people did last week. It was great. But let's just say that you're directing your mind for ease, okay? Which means you can. There's a lot of freedom in that too, because that means that if everything's falling apart and what you want to say is X, you can actually take that critical pause and say Y. Why? Because it's probably more helpful, right? So this is also how we're taking our, our meditation practice off the cushion into our life to be of more benefit. Snow globe, every time, picture yourself in the middle, that's your attention. You are directing your attention. The awareness field is around you. And if you wanna deep dive into that when we do the meditation immersion, please join me because we spend a lot of time here. That's, I mean, this is kind of a weekend in and of itself to be honest with you. Okay, method four, the space between the breaths. I know I shared that quickly. I'm gonna send you the slideshow. I'd rather just tell you about it. Why the space between the breaths? One, because this is where most mind wandering occurs. Two, it's also the place where the greatest insight can come. So we're going to minimize mind wandering and we're going to maximize insight. It's why it's really important for you to understand the breath cycle. There is an inhale, a little pause, an exhale, and a bigger pause. And as you practice more and more, and what I mean is like um, several sessions, like if you go and do a one day or two day or three day retreat, which at this point each of you should be doing, you can, I know I just shit it on you, sorry. You can slow your breathing down and when you slow your breathing down, then those gaps between the breath become greater. Placing your attention there, you're allowed, allowing yourself to just enjoy the rhythm of your natural breath. There's no effort in that part, it happens. And then with precision, you place your attention to that space again and again. And as you work with this, you can even with volition, almost like a fox looking over a rabbit hole, you can watch for the mind wandering to happen. And when you get there, things get really interesting because simultaneously I can feel a thought wanting to arise, but because my attention is so clearly focused on the rabbit hole, it stays down, if that makes sense. Now, we're not trying to reject thoughts, so this is tricky, right? The thoughts come, they go, they're the clouds in the sky. But if you wanna try to amplify your practice where maybe there's less thoughts, less distraction, and you're able to really 
dial into the space between the breaths. This is where you do it and this is how you do it. Now, the trick, going back to the snow globe, is if I do that really loud or the dog barks or the doorbell rings and you're that focused on the rabbit hole, you can jump out of your skin. And that's not helpful either because that means that you've collapsed when you also need the spaciousness. And the way that you work with this, and it is work, like you're gonna all of a sudden find that your meditation practice is not zoning out, you're working. And you might even feel a little tired afterwards, but it's okay to do that once in a while. You know, maybe once a week you say, well, this meditation practice, instead of wanting to like feel good or relax, this meditation practice, I'm actually gonna work. And then make it a short one, make it just like a 10 or 15 minute practice, but work. So the outside of that globe, right? The outside circle of the circumpunct that created that awareness field. As you practice watching with attention, that space between the breath, every two to three breath cycles, you're checking in with the awareness field. What is there? So with your own volition, you actually notice what's there. How does the air feel on my skin? What are the sounds I can hear? And then it gets a little more discreet where you don't have to really ask the questions. You just, you can feel when you collapse. And then that opens up to what else is there. And that's happening more and more naturally. And it's not easy. And I'm happy to coach you. Um, it's worth the endeavor. It's worth the endeavor. It's so worth the endeavor. Oh my God. Okay. <sighs> Method five. Oh, zoomies and snoozies. Oh, this is great. Okay. Zoomies and snoozies. What the hell do I mean by that? The zoomies are when your mind is all over the place. If you've ever seen a dog get the zoomies, they're hilarious, right? They just like, they can't even help themselves. They're just like all over the place, zooming back and forth and back and forth. They're so excited about life. And, you know, your mind might not be excited about life, but it's doing the zoomies. It's just kind of all over the place. And then the snoozies is when we um, are tired and we want to fall asleep, like probably many of you are right now. It's hard to hold our attention for a certain period of time and we're over it. It's about 24 minutes that a human can really hold their attention to much of anything. This is actually different than spacing out. So I just want to clarify that from the start. If you find that you have the zoomies, go back to your five senses. If you want to do them all, you can. I think the two that are most useful in this example is uh, sensation of um, air on your skin and uh, the sounds in your room. So you zoom out and you stay there for a few breaths. Don't be in a hurry. It's all good. This is the place not to be in the hurry. And then if you're sleepy, like if you're literally falling asleep, you know, the classic things are like, stand up, put water on your face. Well, who the hell's doing that? You know what I mean? That doesn't even make sense. So here's a useful thing to do. Take three cleansing breaths, really. Now, I don't say deep because deep breaths can be triggering for people. So if you find deep breaths to be helpful, go for it. Um, if you like ujjayi breath, like the yogic breath, you might try that. Or you can go to the karuna breath of cleansing breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. What you're doing is just oxygenating your body. You're just bringing more oxygen in, trying to perk things up a bit. And that should work. If you need to stand up, fine. But I think that's better advice for like if you're on retreat. If you're in community meditation and you're just falling asleep consistently, you might also look at your sleep cycle. Like maybe you have to go to bed earlier. I go to bed at 8.30 at night and I get up around 5 or 5.30. So just as an inspiration that it's okay to have old lady um, bedtimes like me. <laughs> <laughs> 